We are working through the book of First Peter. And if you're visiting with us, you're picking up in uh, the middle of the series. I think we're at week nine, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, entitled Living as Foreigners. And the title for our message this morning is very simply two words, be holy. If you want to read this text, you will know that that is in fact the essence, the nugget of what this text is really calling us to. Holiness in the scriptures for the believer is not an option. First Peter 13, to, First Peter 1, excuse me, verses 13 to 16 are what we looked at, um, beginning to look at last week. We started in verse 13 and again we'll begin there just to give you a running uh, start at it, so sort of give you the full context, and then we'll read down to verse 16. The text says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. It doesn't take much to see that there are really three commands, if you will, from this text. Verses 13 and following. It tells us to set your hope fully. That's what we looked at last week. Do not be conformed and be holy in all your conduct. We use that sort of as an outline this morning, and we'll look at each one in turn. And just as by way of review and also to help give us some context and to help fill in the blanks so you can begin to see how this greater text all fits together, that nothing is haphazardly said, that is a great, um, you know, point and purpose to everything that he's got there. Let's just take a few moments to go backwards and just take uh, two minutes or so and look back at what we said last week in regard to verse 13, in regard to setting your hope fully. Of course, the word therefore is a reminder of everything that's come on in the first 12 verses to remind us about the salvation, the first subject that Peter picked up. He begins now to change gears in the second gear, and he begins with these commands. The first thing he says to the body, to the church, to the people that he's writing to is in regards to their mind, not be conforming to the world. Therefore, because you've been rescued, because you've been redeemed, because you've been called out of the world, because you are elect, because God has done a work in your life, because of all that Christ has done, he says, gird up the loins of your mind, literally. Tie up the loose ends. Get yourself tied down. Don't be distracted. There are a myriad of things around you that will try to vie for your attention and to get your focus and to get your life goal aiming in this direction. Maybe it's going to be money. Maybe it's going to be your career and your job, your family, wherever. So everything's vying for your attention. He says, look at it. Because you are redeemed, because you are called of God, get your mind tied down. Get the loose things straightened out and get focused. What he says. Be sober minded, clear headed. Don't be distracted going this way and that way. There are, as I said, a myriad of things that will vie for your attention, but he's calling us to be clear headed about our purpose. We were not saved to come to church on a Sunday morning, to go through the rest of the week and to come to church the next Sunday morning, just doing time, waiting to die, so one day you can go to heaven. You are not saved to make a name for yourself, to get yourself ahead, to get, you know, cheer when the Leafs lose again, at the, whatever they do, and to be all excited about what this world is all about. That's, that's not what we're saying. You're to be sober-minded and to focus your heart, your thoughts, your goal, the direction of your life, so the things above. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your focus on the fact that one day Christ will return, that this world will be done, all things will be laid to rest, the books will be opened, your life will be held accountable, your life will be examined, your, what you've done for Christ will be weighed, everything will matter that you do in this world for God. Focus on what really counts. Get your mind tied down. Set your mind on things above. Live sober-minded, clear-headed. Focus on Christ, Christ's return. It's not so much that we're focusing on the event itself, on, you know, what, uh, what 
Israel's doing and what signs are what and oh, it could be any minute. And sure, it could be any minute. And that's not where our focus is. It's on the fact that it could happen, we'll be accountable to him. So he's calling us right away. Get, get the, just a bit of reminder where we've been and understand the context. He's calling us right there. Therefore, because you're saved, set your hope fully. Get your mind focused. And then, this is where we'll spend the bulk of our time this morning and the remainder of these verses, verses 13, or sorry, 14, 15, 16. He now starts with this negative command. Do not be conformed. And he starts this little phrase in verse 14 with this description. Obedient children. As obedient children. That's the way he describes us. Now he could just, if you think about this, it's really a, sort of an unnecessary phrase. He could just go right straight to the command. You know, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do not be informed. But he doesn't. He lays a little bit of groundwork. He couches this in a way to remind you. You know what? Sorry to say, but we are, because we're his children, we are called to obedience. And so this is not just a command that you have to take as if, oh, you know, it's some drudgery thing. It is an obligation on us as believers. Obedient children. Well, I just want to point out a couple of things about this. Draw a couple of thoughts out of this. First one being that we're not, kind of obvious statement, if you know your Bible at all, but the culture, spiritual climate we live in, it's good to just be clear about these things. We're not just children of God by virtue of being a human being. That's a nice thought, and we hear that sometimes in our you know, services that you're in in various places, and people talk about that, oh, we're all children of God. Oh, isn't it all just nice to all just get along, we're all just God's children after all, blah, blah, blah. That is not biblically true whatsoever. We are not all automatically children of God. This classic text in John chapter 1 makes that abundantly clear. He, that's Christ, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, that the world did not know him. So John, of course, starts to lay the groundwork about this, the rejection of Christ and who Christ is. And he talks about the fact that he created the world order and the world system. He came into the world and the world system itself rejected him. Didn't even know who he was. It's the same today. The world system will always continually reject the God who created them. Verse 11. He came to his own, more specifically now, not just the world. He came to the Jewish people. He was a Jew. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So now he starts in a broad sense. The whole world rejected him. Now a class of people, a race of people, they rejected him. But, verse 12, individuals within those greater schemes, individuals did understand who Jesus was. Verse 12 says this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become... Children of God. That is how you become a child of God. It is by receiving Christ. To Christianity, this is fundamental. Verse 13 makes it very clear what he's talking about. In case anybody wants to say, well, see, there it is. We're all children of God. No, no, verse 13. Who were born. Listen, he's trying to explain. Look, we're not talking about a human thing here. It's not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. We're not talking about some human children kind of thing. He's talking about a spiritual birth. It's being the right to become children of God who were born of God, he says. And that's what Peter made clear. You're regenerate. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. And that alone makes you a child of God. Again, Christianity 101, but for the sake of clarity this morning, I thought it would be good to make sure that's very clear. We're talking in this text is talking about those who know the work of the Spirit of God in their life and have brought into that relationship with God. Galatians chapter 4 says it this way. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that's a great Christmas verse, to redeem those who were under the law, that's you and I, born under the law, so that we might receive, what do we receive? Adoption as sons. I don't need to explain adoption to you. Some of you maybe have been adopted, some of you maybe have adopted. Either way, if you haven't, you don't have any idea in your own personal experience, you understand the word. Somebody is born biologically outside of your immediate family, but a process is made such that legal documents are signed and 
an agreement is made and a person comes into your family and for all rights and intents and purposes, they become your legitimate, 100% your child. Even though there was no background together, even though there's no biological connection, they literally become yours. That's exactly the picture of God's family. We are born outside, strange to him, strangers to him, no clue who he is, but he, by virtue of what he has chosen to do, signs the legal document in the blood of Christ and has brought you into his family. You have been adopted. And as adopted children, this is why I'm bringing this up, follow me now, I've been long way to get to the point. As adopted children, you now inherit everything that is a part of your family. That sounds kind of fun. You now become rightful owner of everything that is a part of the family, including family values. Now, wouldn't it make sense that a holy God who calls you now to be his children would expect that his children would behave in a particular manner? Makes sense to me. You have been adopted as obedient Children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Did you have family values growing up? Did you have things that your parents taught you that you thought were, you know, that you thought were important or learned were important? Some of you are passing on your family values to your children. That you know your car is the most important object on earth. That your house is the most important thing you can own. Those kind of values. No, not. You're passing on values and matter. You're teaching them it's not outward appearances and all that kind of thing. That's just natural. There's a myriad of things that we could describe as family values. I know for my family, one of the things that was preeminent when I was growing up, use your manners. It didn't work, but that was what was drilled into our heads. And the big one in my family was please and thank you thing. I can remember being at the table and saying, can I have the sugar? And it would be just silence at the table. My parents would just continue eating and I would go, the sugar? I, can I, I want the sugar. And they would just ignore, completely ignore. <laughs> completely silent. I'd be like, sugar, can I have silence? <laughs> then your little mind starts to work and you're like, mm, this isn't working, what's going on? <laughs> My mother would kind of see you puzzling, and she would say, I'm waiting for a magic word. <laughs> I would say, Abracadabra. <laughs> Still didn't get the sugar. <clears throat> Family values, you pass them on, you learn what's important from your parents. And as obedient children, wouldn't it make sense that the values that God is wanting to pass on to you is in regards to your living, to your behavior, to your holiness. Why? Because it's who he is. Look what he says in Ephesians chapter 1, this concept of being chosen and holiness. They're always together in Scripture. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why did he choose us? So that we should be holy and blameless before him. His call on our life from the beginning was a call to holiness. Therefore, as obedient children, you're brought into this family by the work of the Spirit of God. You're being passed on those family values. It's kind of, in a sense, not an optional thing. This is what is expected of you in this family. This is how you're going to behave under the headship and the leadership of God as your father. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Wow, that is an interesting statement. Do not be conformed. I don't need to tell you what conformed means. It just means to be shaped. It means to be pressed into a mold. To be allowing what used to be your old way of thinking to be the way you behave anymore. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The world lives, the human heart outside of Christ lives according to its own passions, its own desires. It just follows its heart. It just does whatever it wants. If it feels good to me, the law doesn't matter, God doesn't matter, I'm into it. 
I want what makes me happy. And I go here, I chase there, I just do whatever it takes. And I'm looking under every rock, and sure, I may have some moral moorings and some, you know, values that will direct me, but in the overall scheme of things, all my heart wants is what it wants. And if I'm greedy after money, I'm going to chase after to believing that's where my happiness is. If I'm greedy after people and, and sexual desires, that's where I'm going to chase out. If it's food, if it's, if it's feeding my taste buds and being a glutton, I'm going to chase after these things. This is how the world lives, not to an extent, not to the nth degree all the time, but it's the natural heart. And he's telling us, reminding us, this is how you used to live in your former ignorance. Your former ignorance. You didn't know any better. You had no idea. It's like you're born spiritually with your head in the sand. You've got no clue how to live right. You've got something in your heart, naturally speaking, outside of Christ. You've got something in your heart that tells you lying is wrong, and you know that it's wrong. But when the circumstances are such, and it's to your benefit to cover over something, or it's to your benefit to fudge on your taxes or whatever the case, or it's to your benefit, well then, your conscience takes the back seat, and I follow my passions. I do what makes sense for me. I'm chasing after my own happiness, and I'm living in absolute ignorance to God's rules and God's laws. I don't care anything about God's laws. I'm not interested in anything to do with holiness. I'm just doing what makes me happy. Oh, but I'm a good person. We always have to throw that in right away. But I'm still a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a good person in your own mind, but not in the eyes of God. What happens? We follow after our own heart and we tell ourselves that ultimately God's law doesn't even matter. I came across this picture and thought it was priceless. No vending from State Highway. <coughs> Something wrong there. Well, we know what the law is, but it's irrelevant what the law is because I know what I want to do. And that's how we live. But what happens when you come to Christ? Everything <coughs> changes. By virtue of coming to Christ, you have made a declaration that you want done with your sin. You have turned from your sin. You have made a declaration you want through with your old ways. It's a struggle all the way through the rest of your God-given days on earth. But in your heart of hearts, you have repented, to use a biblical word. You've turned your back on your sin. And now your heart is to chase after righteousness. Colossians chapter 3, Paul reminds the church there the same, something of the same thing. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now, because you are in crisis and all is complying, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, another seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is bring renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Put off your old ways. Get rid of your old self. Do not be conformed to your former passions. That's what he's calling us to. It's a negative command. And then he has a positive command. Do not be conformed, but be holy in all your conduct. Why? He who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. The word holy is a word that we probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time in. It ultimately means separateness. It means set apart, set aside. It is a, a word that describes something that is otherly. It is different. It is different by extremes when it comes to God. The holiness of God is something that we can hardly barely find words to describe. God is so far away above us, different than us, separate from us, unlike us, on so many levels, not just a mortal level, morally of course. And he's, the reason that we are called to holiness is because this is the character of God. I don't need to tell you God's attributes, but they are all touched by his holiness. Short list of them, God's Love is goodness, is wrath, is justice, is mercy. All of these are tempered by who God is. His otherliness, his set apartness, his differentness. So his love is different than your love. It's not like anything you know of love. It's far and away. It's not biased. It is not 
prejudiced. It is unconditional. It is not a love that we can ex experience in and of ourselves. His goodness is holy goodness. He does not show favoritism to anyone. His wrath is perfect, holy wrath. It's not fly off the hand or handle anger kind of thing that we think of when we think of wrath. It is not a, a, a quality that is a negative quality. It is a positive quality in God. It is unlike anything that we know of wrath. It's holy wrath. His justice is perfect. He knows everything. He can weigh a situation with absolute perfection. He can call exactly the sentence that is precise to the crime. There is nothing hidden. There is nothing secret. Everything is known. It is perfect, holy justice. His mercy is the same. It is holy mercy. It is not like any mercy that we can know. God is far and away separate from everything that we have experienced. He is holy. Holy, holy, holy. So holy, so separate that He even calls His people to live out, in a sense, a reflection of who their Father is. If you know the Old Testament, you know the laws of the Old Testament, and you know that there are laws of forbidding people from touching or being near or being a part of certain things. Leviticus chapter 11. Let me just read a section of that to you. Every, every swarming thing that swarms on the ground is detestable. It shall not be eaten. Whatever goes on its belly and whatever goes on all fours or whatever has many feet, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shall not eat. For they are detestable. Shall not make for yourselves detestable. You shall not make yourselves, excuse me, detestable with any swarming thing that swarms. And you shall not defile yourselves with them. And you come unclean through them. Why? Why? Everyone's asking, what's the big deal? I don't get it. Why can't I do that? Verse 44. For I and the Lord your God consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am and holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Do you understand verse 45? I brought you up out of that land. Egypt was a place of slavery, it was a place of paganism. It was a place, place of debauchery, of sin. I brought you up out of that. Not so that you could continue to live like that. I brought you up out of that so that you would be a different people. You would be separate from that kind of behavior. You would be set apart from that kind of thinking. You would be entirely different. You would be, in fact, in a word, holy. You would be unlike anybody else in the world. Be holy. Because I am holy. Be separate. Because I am separate. Verse 20, or sorry, chapter 20 of Leviticus says something like the same thing. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean, and the unclean bird from the clean. This is, of course, just by way of those who aren't familiar with the Old Testament, not talking about, you know, animals that fell in the mud. We're talking about morally clean or morally unclean, appropriate, inappropriate, however you want to say it. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean, the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by any... Anything with which the, crop, the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean, you shall be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And right from the beginning, we see this biblical principle. It is the principle that Peter is drawing on. People like to say, oh, we're not under the law anymore. Oh, we don't have to obey the Old Testament law. It's true. I don't have to worry about whether I put a cricket in my mouth or whether I put a piece of pork in my mouth. It's irrelevant now. I'm not under the Old Testament law. But Peter is pointing out the fact that holiness is still a New Testament requirement. Why? Because the principle of the Old Testament still stands. We are held to the principle of the thing. That we are called out of the world. That we are called to be a separate people. We are called to be set apart. In a word, we are called to be holy. Now our little religious minds like to take that and make a little list. 
We have the church lady who likes to be, and thankfully I haven't met the church lady in this church, who likes to make sure that everybody's got their T's crossed and their I's dotted. Your pants are too long and too short. Your skirt's not, your hair is this. Men shouldn't have a beard. You shouldn't be. And you've got your list of things. Women don't dye their hair. Whatever the list. Everybody likes to have a list in their own spirit. So I, those things are pretty wild and clearly not a part of our vernacular, but don't tell me you don't have a list. Everybody's got things that they like to think that because they're on their list, because they don't do them, therefore they are holy. That's a scary road to be on. It's very tempting for a religious heart to think and feel safety in a group of lists. But it's very hard to stand up to them biblically. You know what the call is? Be holy. If something leads you to the violent, then don't touch it. If something is going to take you down a road you shouldn't go, then don't go near it. Simple. It's not about a list. It's not, do not watch TV. You know why I don't watch TV, a lot of TV? I watch TV like everybody else, but I don't pay a whole lot of attention. You know why? Because the vast majority of it, and you know this, is unacceptable entertainment. It makes my mind go places it doesn't need to go. It makes my heart wander into places I don't need to think. It makes my mind get twisted in areas and begin to think, and I'm, whoa, whoa, whoa. And you find yourself, ha, laughing at stuff that isn't even funny. Shut it off! Why? Because I'm a legalist? It's on my list. I shall not watch TV. And if I don't watch TV, I am a holy person. No! It's because if I do that, it defiles me. So therefore, I do not do that thing. I find no joy in finding that my spirit is heavy and my heart is full of sin and my thoughts are, you know, far away and away from where they should be. There's no joy in walking with God when my heart is filled with myself. She consider maybe it's time to not go to the beach anymore. How horrible is it to say that out loud? I mean, what fashion is doing with whatever's going on, and i got to be careful what I say because I don't need to put images in your head. But honestly, it's time to start thinking maybe we shouldn't just go there because of what is going on. It's not because it's on my list, because if I don't do that, I'm a holy person. I'm so much holier than them and them because I don't do this and I don't do that. It's got nothing to do with that. It's all about you being separate from anything that would bring defilement to your life. Why? Because you are not to be conformed by your old way of thinking, not to go the old, old passions way of life. Just you are a brand new person as obedient children. Be undefiled. Be separate. Be holy. Command. It is required. It is not an option. But as he who called you is holy, as he who called you is separate, who's far and away different from everything else, you also be far and away different in everything else. This is why we stand out. This is why we're a little bit weird in this world. This is why we know that we are foreigners in this land. We just don't fit in anymore. There's things here that are distasteful to me. There's things here that you want to call me a, a, a prude and call me names and call me a snob and call me, you know, legalistic. One person's holiness is often another person's legalism. Somebody looks at somebody's holiness and they go, well, there's the legalistic. Well, there's the legalistic. You can call me what you want to call me. I am living my life in an effort to walk in such a manner that God is pleased with me. And in such a manner that the Spirit of God can pick me up as a clean vessel and use me for her purposes. And if he chooses to do so, may his name be praised. But if I am going around touching every foolish, foolhardy thing, defiling my heart, not giving any thought to what I watch or read or listen to, or it doesn't matter, nothing matters, we're not under the law, I'll just do what I want, and nilly willy, but surprise! You have no joy of walking with God. God goes a million miles away. Your heart is heavy with sin. You, you, you don't know what it is to serve God in joy. Be holy in all your conduct. It's not done by a list of do's and don'ts. It is done by your own conscience that chooses and desires to walk with God. 
chooses to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Because God has put that in you. And we do this as obedient children. Why? Because it's written. Here's the principle of the Old Testament. You shall be separate. You shall be different. You shall be holy because that's who I am. And you are my children. And I am your father. And as being adopted into my family, this is the family value preeminent that I pass on to all my children. Behave yourself. Sit up straight. Use your manners. And be holy. And live as foreigners.